Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are, and welcome to the latest edition of Free Thought Hour, our chat show where we have an interesting guest. And tonight, helping me is my co host. Welcome, Tercia. <laughs> You've gone frozen. <laughs> oh, dear, we've got no sound from you. What's the matter, Tercia? Have you lost your voice? Maybe I'll take you down and bring you back again. <laughs> Let me try that. <clears throat> well, Tercia, I've never known Tercia to be speechless. <laughs> so I'll introduce our honoured guest tonight, and it's Chet Adamson. Have I said that right? A Anderson. Anderson, yes. yes. Now, how the devil are you, Chet? I'm very good. Uh, thanks, John. And, and I'm really honoured to be on the show. I... I, I I, I just met you, uh, but I've now found out so many things that you do, and it, and it's really fascinating, so I'm really happy to be here. Well, well, thank you. We, we enjoy what we do, and it's our honor, though, to have you. Can you speak now, Tessie, or have you gone really mute? Oh, we still can't hear you. What's the matter? You're not muted at my end. Let me check your volume. No, you're okay. It's your end, Tercia. I don't know what you've done. Keep trying. <clears throat> anyway, Chet, we, yes. we bumped into each other on one of the uh, social media sites, didn't we, where uh, we were, I think we were having a discussion with some non-scientists, is a kind way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly theists. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. I, th I think we were discussing, um, you know, nominalism basically how it is uh right. the, the reality of universals or something like that and mm. so you reached yeah. out to me and i guess it seems that this is something that both of us have struggled on for the last uh, few years and done a lot of thinking about mm. it's, yeah, it's really complicated absolutely well i'm i'm a retired science teacher and i only got engaged in this sort of face-to-face -face activity and interacting with people who aren't scientists quite recently because uh, you know I, I started the channel and started meeting all these interesting people but I didn't know it was called nominalism which yeah was a, that was which, a long time for me as well uh for years we talked about you know do numbers exist you know and yeah. what are they and did they exist from before the universe was invented and, mm. and you know, how did they come about did we invent them yeah. And yeah, it was William of Ockham that came up with this idea that yeah. they're just names. Who used to live just 45 minutes up the road from here. In there's, Ockham. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. There's no there's no sign of his existence. There's no house of Ockham or relic or any, anything. Then then maybe Yeah, he was that was before he was put on house arrest by the Pope yeah. in Avignon. And yes. then uh, after he was there for 20 years, he got tired of being there. So he took a trip to Munich, and he was excommunicated for that. Yeah, yeah. And and, so, and then they then lots of Catholics have tried to cover up his work. So generally, you haven't heard about him, but I'm really impressed. I think he's the most undervalued philosopher in all of history. Yeah, absolutely. Hey. Can you guys hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, whatever Will you've you done, do? working. I'm glad. Mm. Were you talking now, about Spinoza? by any chance no no we're talking about William of Ockham and I'm I'm trying to get Chet to explain to our audience what nominalism is okay well I, I don't know if that's something you're familiar with but I started thinking about how do we you know how do we really get to there and I felt that that there's a bunch of things you need to understand and um this all became something that 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 i came upon by basically studying consciousness uh, i got really interested in it my background is physics and computer science mm -hmm. uh, and and yet uh you know about 20 years ago um i started really getting interested in consciousness because i felt that consciousness the origin of consciousness was one of the things that kept creationists as creationists if yeah. they can't see how it evolves, then, you know, this becomes, you know, a barrier and 
creationists were making their way into uh, teaching creationism in science classes in America. And that yeah. really bothered me. So I thought I'd look into it a little bit and see if I could understand it. And I came up with a list of things that you kind of need to understand if you want to understand the basis. And I have a set of 20 questions. So um, I kind of feel that these are questions that you should ask yourself and have some sort of an answer to if, if you want to try to understand how it all fits together. Yeah. And, when I, I, you know, I can give you the questions and my answers uh, as well here. Uh, the audience may have different answers and that's fine. But just remember that, that the way you answer these questions affects your worldview and, and your worldview affects the answer that you're going to get to, you know, the ultimate questions. Like. Yeah. And, and what you've done is you've sort of dissected it. So because the, a common mistake is for people to look at the finished, complex, sophisticated product and, and wonder about how it happened. And That's right. they, they've got no idea of the the rungs of the ladder that it's been through to get there. Yeah, and it's a wicked question in the sense that the answer that you come to depends on how you start approaching your answer. So it's yes. the path that you go down initially that could lead you to the wrong answer. So you, you kind of have to get some things fleshed out and have some pretty good grounding. And then on that grounding, which colors your world, you then attempt to answer the big questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you want to start with the questions? Well, so, yeah, I, I'm not at all. Sorry, before you do that, yeah. I'd, like, I'd like to ask you your personal history, because we, we usually ask people how they got to be the person they are today, because we're sitting here sort of pontificating about science versus theism. Yeah. But were you ever a theist or... I was, yeah, I was. Um, I, I, grew up, I grew up in a very um, liberal Christian family. Okay, so we went to church, you know, when the ski hill wasn't open, that kind of thing. Um, uh, I then, in my twenties, uh, I went, I dove in, and you know, I got uh, baptized and the whole thing, and it was a kind of a fundamentalist thing, and and I, I really, you know, I really gave it a try. There were a lot of people there I respected and, you know, and they believed. And I said, oh, gosh, these guys, I respect them so much. They believe there, you know, there really must be something to this. So I gave it a good go, um, but then decided that, you know, it doesn't really add up and uh, went through a bunch of uh, years as a kind of a agnostic and a deist and uh, eventually ended up um, in, in this looking into consciousness. Uh, I ran into the atheists and uh, joined a couple organizations because I felt that basically th the atheists are one of the most oppressed populations in the world. And yeah. I'm not sure I'm an atheist, to be honest, but I think I felt like I had to stand up with them because, mm -hmm. you know, really they shouldn't be subjected to that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and so anyway, that's uh, that's how I got here. Again, I did get a degree in physics. Uh, decided that wasn't going to be as exciting as computer science. So I did that. And that was most of my career. And that was a long time ago. I don't want to admit how many years ago it was. <laughs> but then <clears throat> in the last 10 years, I've been hanging around with a bunch of friends. And we're, you know, we're amateur philosophers, right? We've been reading the greats and discussing them. And, you know, it just blows me away. It, you know, Kant and Hegel just impressive minds just it it makes me feel really small but i love reading it because you know it's something to aspire for and to see if i could uh, fit in there somehow i don't know well yeah me too i didn't study philosophy but i've come to it late like you and i find it fascinating so so the the first thing that I always stress in, in any, and I've given a number of presentations on this, is a subject called self-organization. If you get nothing from this discussion, at least get some sort of an understanding of what self-organization is. It's a real thing in the world. And the example I often use is a snowflake. I mean, what what is it that puts a snowflake together? Well, nothing. I mean, it's just the water molecules themselves. They're just yeah. bouncing around in there. And there happens to be, like any crystal, there happens to be a place where the water molecule will stick. 
And so they stick there and then there's another place where they'll stick and it, you know, builds this all by itself. It yes, organizes right. the water molecules into a shape. Yes. And we see the same phenomena in a whole bunch of things. Uh, you know, uh, whirlpools in a stream, self-organized, hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, self-organized. And one of the most important and most plentiful uh, examples is, is life itself. So when you plant a tree, what's it doing? It's taking gas out of the air, it's taking carbon dioxide out of the air and organizing it into the body of the plant or in the body of the tree. Um, so it sits there and it organizes stuff. And do we need an external intelligent agent to do that? No, no, we don't. Um, this stuff self-organizes. Stars self-organize. Galaxies self-organize. So it's a real phenomenon. See it for what it is. And then, you know, from that, you can recognize how some other things might have might have appeared that way. Yeah. Well, you sent me your list of questions and I had an attempt at providing my answers to them. Oh, so, so you've got what is self-organization and I've got the capability to order components into an array. The key there is not that you organize it, but the fact that the stuff itself organizes itself. Yes. Now it can be an array, but it turns out that uh, this appears at many different levels. And for example, a, a lot of people consider a hurricane not very organized. Now, it is organized. It's organized into a storm, and the storm is a repeating pattern. But mm -hmm. a lot of people think of a hurricane as the epitome of disorganization. Yeah. Um, and so I've struggled with the word organization, and people have pushed back on that. And I'm and I'm proposing a new word, uh, which I'm calling orgos. And orgos is just the stuff that self-organization produces. Um, I haven't really defined it very well, so but we can talk about that. But the key is that every time you see self-organization, it does a different kind of organizing. How are you um, spelling it? Do you spell it in half? Orgos. Orgos. O-R-G-O-S. Yeah. So I, I just I, made I, it up, and um, I just I just need a label to talk about this, and uh, it, that's very new. It's not it's not very well defined, and maybe it'll stick, and maybe it won't. But it's not entropy. It's not the opposite of entropy. It's not enthalpy either. Either there's a bunch of quantities. Uh, the problem with organization is some people think about human organizations, which are almost always hierarchical. Sometimes people think of organization as being uh, put in order, like say in alphabetical order or in numerical order, but it's a different concept than that. So it means kind of structured. Go ahead. I wanted to say that um, I've come to this conversation totally unprimed. So it's funny how human centric we think because, and um, I have an, a background in literature and, and education. So yes. when you said self-organization, it's interesting how, how one's background shapes what one thinks because John, with a strong background in biology, Yep. Uh, your answer led to something that I could see links to biology as, as a, a person who studied in the humanities and who works with humans and with children. And, and I, w w when I heard self-organization, I was immediately thinking about people organizing oneself, one's thoughts, yes. one's ideas. Yes. So, so perhaps uh, Orgos, I, I like the idea of creating, inventing new words. So, Maybe the first, if, if, if I ask this question to, um, uh, maybe it should be important to stress that the self is maybe a little bit misleading in the sense, because most people go to self as in a person. So yeah, a person. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It turns out that the same phenomenon in social science is called spontaneous organization or spontaneous order. Yeah. Uh, so. uh, Okay. Okay. Oh. Interesting. So the next question, John, is what is life? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is, I've had some interesting conversations about this, particularly with Professor Lee Cronin, who is at Glasgow University in charge of the very department that's uh, trying to do a couple of things like um, make life from inorganic chemicals. Mm -hmm. yeah, new kinds of life. Yeah. A, a biogenesis, and he's also trying to do what he calls chem computation or computation. He, he realizes, yeah, yeah, he realizes that the the chemical universe 
is much larger than the physical universe because there's a limitless number of compounds that can be formed. Yes. So, so he's trying to, on the basis of chemical reactions, he's trying to work out how, I'm not sure how he does this, but he's trying to work out how you get from reactant to product in a generalized way so that he can hypothesize putting X and Y in and seeing what comes out in a, in a computational way. Yeah, I think we're going to see a lot more of those uh, molecular computers, right? You can set them up to solve a particular problem. And then you can just throw a whole bunch of molecules in a, in a beaker and let them go. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So what is life? That's what is back, life? In my, back in my days as a biology teacher, I had the answer. You know, it was easy. I had a, a list of properties of life, which, in fact, we had a mnemonic for. I used to write I used, on the blackboard back in the days of, you know, chalk and blackboards. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, long time ago, I used to write the word marriage down the vertically down the blackboard. And then I marriage, yeah, and, and and then I used to get go around the class and get them to suggest properties of life. And somebody would say movement, so I would write that alongside the M. And somebody else would say re reproduction, so I'd write that alongside one of the R's. And eventually, we get this list of movement assimilation respiration, reproduction, irritability, and water balance, a bit of a cheat because we, we wanted an A, growth and excretion. And those were simplistic, but, you know, for secondary school kids, the, yeah. the way of defining life and distinguishing it from non-life. That's pretty good. And I've got a simpler definition, which is it, it's a self-organizing thing which reproduces and that and and that to me is the key if it's reproducing itself if you make a copy of itself i'm exactly. willing to call it alive exactly yeah so that was back then years ago and subsequently we, i've realized particularly in conversations with lee for example that most or quite a lot of things that we accept are living don't pro, don't perform all of those characteristics yeah and, and so you've got to shorten the list down because uh, and s some things don't even move, you know, and, and some things don't grow and, and some things you can you can keep them dehydrated for years and, and so on and so forth. So you're knocking things out of this list. And eventually the only one that's left is the as the um, what would be the word, the, the paradigmic uh, archetypal single recognizable characteristic of life is replicability yeah mm. that's it yeah yeah and virus i think virus falls below that so i don't call viruses alive they, no. they can't reveal themselves you know? that's right they've got to hijack a living cell before they yeah. Yeah. can do anything mm. i like so that I'll, i'm sorry go ahead i said i like that i mean i i I, I will teach my um, students that uh, from now on because they also learn that the marriage thing only in Afrikaans. But uh, I, I, I agree that uh, reproducing the ability to reproduce um, the, with the self, uh, self organization. Yeah. And, and being uh, reproduction then opens a new kind of self organization. So um, evolution, for example can only happen with something that reproduces uh, mm -hmm. because the successful examples get copied. So now you get a bunch of copies of the successful examples. So it allows for a much, much more rapid uh, change and advancement and adaptation. Yes, how, about, how about the next one? What is emergence? Yeah, well, now, again, this is this is an um, interesting concept, isn't it? Because a, a lot of people don't accept emergence a lot of people think for example we're talking about consciousness mm -hmm. that there's a there's a, a discontinuity there's there's a division between the consciousness and the the brain so that we have this duality idea and somehow or other this one can't turn into that one that yes. it, this one is floating spiritually independently and of course that's nonsense but 
I, I think probably the, the simplest example of emergence, it, it, what, it, what it is, is the, the appearance of additional qualities from a collection of items that a, a single one doesn't exhibit. That's exactly it. Yes. So, okay. The easiest example is temperature and pressure. In a gas, you you know, gas has a temperature, solids have a temperature, uh, a gas has a pressure, but mm. the individual molecules have neither of those. That's right. Well, my, my preferred example is water, because it's something that we consider to be wet. Yes. But if if you take one, words one, words molecule of water, one molecule of water cannot be wet, because what we recognize as wetness is actually a thin film of connected molecules, uh, coherent, um, co-adhesed, uh, no, ad adhesed together. No. Uh, I can't think of the right language. But the point is, it's the cold produced by the evaporation of this thin film, which <laughs> is the phenomenon that we call wetness. And you, you can't detect that from a single molecule. It has to be a film. No, and another good one is... I'm sorry, go ahead, Tercia. I wanted to ask how far off would I be if I said that it's the the idea that the um, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, something to that effect? It's it's something like that, but it's not just that the whole is greater, but that there is a there's a new property. It yes. gains a new property that wasn't there before you put this stuff together. Yes. Okay. The word greater the problematic, the, the, so, but the idea is the sum of the parts is something totally different with different attributes than it, the individual parts. It, it is very closely related to this idea that the sum is greater than the parts. That's synergy in general, but this is particularly these new properties emerge Property. that weren't there before. Yeah. Mm. Um, the better example that I use is water waves, ocean waves, uh, you know, yeah. a big pool of water. It will, it will form these waves and it'll do so spontaneously. Those waves don't exist in the molecule. You go look at the molecule as closely as you want to, and you'll never see a wave. Yeah. That's the, the difference between the wave particle duality there. Right there. Oh, no, it isn't. Oh, look at no. <laughs> no. No. And uh, there is no wave particle duality. I mean, the, the, the reason we think about wave particle duality is that we can think about particles and we can think about waves but what the fundamental waves of the universe are is something different than those. So um, does that make sense? It's the difficulty is just for us to think about it because our intuition is wrong. Mm. And well, that's, we have two sets of equations which we apply in circumstances where one works better than the other. I, I have something as, as a language teacher. I, since you began to ask your questions, and I've come across this every, in every single conversation, I think that the trouble is words and the meanings that words have. Because uh, yes. when you say wave, when, when you talk about an ocean wave, yes. um, and then you talk in, in, in a wave, the principle of a wave as in a light that is a wave and a particle, it's mm -hmm. not the same. But we no. use the same words because our, our, our vocabulary, our, our ability to describe things mm -hmm. is, uh, is limited uh, still, despite the fact that that language grows continuously. So almost that, every word we use is a metaphor constructed from a simpler concept. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about time as a journey and we're actually using the journey as a metaphor for time. So when mm -hmm. we talk about, you know, and, and anyway, yeah, that's uh, a big fan of George Lakoff, and he's he's explored that uh, in quite a bit of detail, and highly recommend uh, some of his. Can you spell? Work. Can you can you spell the surname, please? L a k o f f. Oh. And okay. he's at Berkeley, UC Berkeley. Right. Okay. Got that. Um. So, something went through my brain a minute ago that seemed relevant at the time. Now I've forgotten what it was. Was it a wave? <laughs> It was about language because you're you're right that every every word is more or less a metaphor for some concept or other. Yeah. But un unfortunately, we've all got our own. Very often, we all have our own metaphors for these for these symbols that we call words. 
magical woods. Um, we so we obviously have to have the same meanings for us to communicate. There has to be some similarity in meanings, and we pick these up at a very very pre pre language uh, phase. We pick up some various meanings, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. It it, it comes into intentionality, and and from that we can build up. And when you go through school, you've already started with the basic ideas that you're going to have the rest of your life. But what you're then doing is you're building metaphors upon metaphors as you go through school until you can start to express very, very complex ideas. But the way I learn a complex idea is by having it explained to me in terms of metaphors, which represent actually other things. And, and begin, beginning with, with most often something literal. And then you grow from the literal to the figurative. That yes. so, so, uh, um, was it. Was it Oscar Wilde who's who? This I think it was Oscar Wilde who said the the biggest problem with human communication is that we think it is successful. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, there is there is that, and that and that ties into the universals. But we've got a little ways to go. The oh. the key about, the key about self organization is I I there's a huge. Um, intuition that things can't organize themselves and i'm trying to get people beyond that because you've got to let go of that everything we build tables roofs cars bicycles all that stuff it all falls apart eventually nothing you never see a bicycle assemble itself you never see a house never see a roof get better right everything humans build tend to fall apart but that's not a general principle of the universe the universe builds things that build themselves you let go of that and then emergence is another one we think that nothing new can come out of putting things together but actually emergence shows it can and there's lots of simple examples of that so the next question is what drives that because you've all heard the second law of thermodynamics says entropy has to increase so how does this all work and i don't know if you have an answer for that john or you want me to just dive in on that well yeah i'll have a stab at it um of course the second law of thermodynamics only operates in a closed system right right so so given that there's no evidence that the universe is a closed system and and that we know that certain elements in it produce a lot of energy yeah that can be captured and used to drive organization elsewhere that energy yeah. Yeah, that's it. So um, although the closed system uh, does, in fact, always gain entropy, the entropy is not distributed evenly. There are parts that decrease in entropy while there are other parts that increase in it. And again, Ilya Prigogine calls those dissipative structures. So dissipative structures are things that through the flow of energy tend to decrease entropy, right? They tend to get more organized. Yeah, yeah. Theoretically, of course, at the end of time, not something we got to worry about immediately. Well, then, so yeah, I mean, the point is a snowflake organizes itself, but actually it releases more energy to the external world than, than it, um, it, it, it increases entropy elsewhere. Yes. More than the decrease that the snowflake gets. Yes. Yes. Cause it's, it's achieving a, a lowest energy level of, uh, combination. The, the, the excitement of the molecules is decreasing by their crystallization. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly so, right. So, but, but ultimately, I mean, if we go to the end of the universe, then the, the available energy will be so feebly dissipated that it won't be able to continue with it. I think so. Yeah, it seems to be the heat death of the universe. Other people yeah. see the big the big rip, which is that it continues expanding so fast that it just rips everything apart. But yeah, so if you if you look at a system, it will tend to go from um, low entropy to a little bit more organized and then a lot less organized. And so I think the general path of the universe is that way. Right now, we're in a part of the history of the universe where it seems to be organizing things. On the whole, it's not, but but there are parts of it that are organizing, and and there'll be a maximum of that, a maximum organization, or mm. or orgos, if you will, and then and eventually the universe will go into a phase where it'll become less and less organized. Mm. Mm. Same thing happens when you mix a cup of coffee. If you have a cup of coffee with cream on top, it mm. starts with very simple, 
But as you stir it, you get these swirls and things. And those swirls are an increase in complexity until oh, finally you stir it enough and it becomes all smooth again. I'm not going to hold my breath for the heat death of the universe, though. Don't worry about it. <laughs> the sun will wipe out the earth long before that. Yeah. Oh, good news. Good news. <laughs> so if we start with those basic things, I kind of see the the world, you know, this is my model of metaphysics, is there's a level one, and the level one is matter, matter and energy. Um, these are the these are the waveforms of, of the universe that obey the uh, Schrodinger equation. And those are basically eternal. Energy lasts forever. Energy is always conserved. Uh, momentum is always conserved. Uh, these things are perpetual. On top of that, you have layer two, which is the patterns. Uh, matter can be organized into patterns. So one pattern is a water molecule. Um, yep. And obviously large, complex chains of hydrocarbons, another mm. pattern. And, uh, and a snowflake is another pattern. Yep. Level three is what I call processes. Now, processes are patterns that change over time. They either go through a cycle or they, you know, they go through some sort of flow of uh, through yeah. a set of patterns. Yeah, and, see, I, I got for that when you pose the question, what is a process? I got an undergoing of change from a beginning towards an end. But you've put it much better. I see it as a cycle. In fact, the simplest process I can think of is the orbit of a planet around a star. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's always moving, but but the pattern is so repetitive and so simple that I think you know we can really easily grasp that this is this is something that's going through a set of cycles. And yeah. obviously, something like life. Life is a process. It it goes through a there's a flow of material, and that flow of material goes through a bunch of steps, and it. It either organizes things or disorganizes things, but whatever it is, life works, right? Yeah. Now, that's something that a lot of theists that I, I discuss with don't like. They, they don't like me saying what Richard Dawkins famously said, you know, look at science, it works, bitches. I don't know if you remember that. Do you remember that? No, it's a good quote of his. He's, he's got a little video clip of that. Um, because what they want is some uh, conceptual justification for it. Yeah, they they want to go to the grounding in in thought, and I'm saying that's not important. You know, look at it; it works. It works, and they often think of life as a stuff. It's it's a magic ingredient that you add to it. I mean. When I, you know, when I went through grade school, that was commonly accepted that you had to have this special stuff called life. Yeah. And I eventually learned that no, it's just chemicals. You know, it really yeah. is just chemicals. Mm -hmm. Well, well, even even matter in the end is begins with even non-living things. It's just um, a chemistry. But um, I, I forgot. I, I wanted to say something about theists. Uh, I think we find it very difficult to realize that we are observers from within a system in which we are simultaneously observers and participants because we are we are all of these things we are also um self-organizing beings we are alive we we humans display emergence mm. um and and i think that's what what makes it so difficult for for yeah. it, it's a very uncomfortable idea to realize mm. We, we are actually just observing um, yes. because because in the world that we live in we are always agents um, yes. and and we have a very high regard for agency but now mm -hmm. we're observing systems and we cannot find the agency yep. and that yep. makes it very uncomfortable um, what you, what you so. said there, what you said there meshes with some thinking I've done quite recently because our we've We've manipulated our environment. Most of us live in cities, which are entirely man-made. So we know that an agent is required to produce stuff. And we are fairly disconnected with the natural world where things happen without any human intervention. So that poses a, 
it means that they've got to undergo a leap of imagination that they're not really prepared to to do. And that, that's uncomfortable. It, it's really uncomfortable because it's almost as if a um, if a, a Lego uh, a, a little Lego man becomes conscious and realizes that I'm part of a greater system of which I'm part and I'm simultaneously observing it. It's, it's a very, it is a bit mind, it is a bit mind boggling really. It um, is. It is very hard for a conscious agent to understand what a conscious agent is. I, I mean, you're limited by your, you know, how can you, how can anything ever understand itself? Right. Cause that would require more information than you have. Right. So um, that's, that is indeed what we're grappling with uh, at the next level, which is, and, and notice that, Level one uh, is is matter, matter and energy. Level two is yeah. patterns, which is built on matter. Level mm. three is processes, which are built on patterns, which are built on matter. So mm. level four is something that I call intentionality. And intentionality is, is the way for something to be about something else. So when you have a word... Um, I mean, the word doesn't have intentionality, but in, in your head, there's a there's the meaning of the word. And, and that actually has intentionality. Intentionality is a way that something can refer to something else. Mm -hmm. And built on this, uh, you can then explain a lot about how language works and you can explain about how we think. Uh, for example, when you have a, a memory, well, I'll go into this in a, in a moment, but... Um, let me, yeah. Uh, well, intentionality is, I'm sorry, it's level four. And and there could be more levels above that. I haven't quite worked that out. Maybe level five is consciousness. Maybe level six is social structures. I'm still working on, on, on trying to get that there. But all the magic stuff happens above level three. And what's really interesting is that science has restricted itself. Physics and chemistry have restricted themselves to the bottom three levels. You always exclude a human action from an experiment, right? We set up all of our experiments yeah. to not have humans in the middle making decisions, right? Because otherwise that would ruin the experiment. Yes. So we found out everything about levels one through three, but level four definitely exists. And right. uh, there's no reason to deny that there is intentionality, there are thoughts, there there is meanings, there are desires, there are actions that we take. And, and, and that is... That's why the social sciences are so hard and why social science experiments are so hard to replicate because yes. you cannot take the human out of it. There is no. no way to take the human out of it. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And, and this is also why some of these theists that we're talking about have a difficulty because they, they want to do reductionism. They want to say, we're made of molecules, Molecules can't have intentionality, therefore it must be a spiritual thing. Exactly. Because they're disregarding emergence. Yes. If, if, I follow, if I follow your, your levels, then, then oh. this is actually quite, uh, I find this very helpful because um, it's just given a, a, a vocabulary. My only job will now be to translate this into Afrikaans. How am I going to do that? <laughs> That's going to be tough. Shouldn't be too hard. <laughs> we need an app to do that. We didn't have to do that. Yeah, yeah. But 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 we are now with which question um, did we reach? We're now down to posing the question: What is consciousness? Oh, okay. A hard question. Is that's a tough one. Yeah, you got to define it right if you're going to just explain what how it came about. Yeah. Well, now here's the thing: because once again, we know what consciousness is because we meet it in ourselves and in our friends and family and other members of society all the time. And we know that one easy definition of consciousness is it's the opposite of unconsciousness. Uh, okay. But that's not that helpful. <laughs> no, it's not very helpful at all. No. But if you look at the huge, I'm not going to use the phrase kingdom of life. If you look at the huge range of biodiversity, you'll see that there's some organisms that are very sophisticated and have quite powerful consciousnesses, and I'd like to include humans in that. But yeah. then other organisms are aware. They do have awareness of their surroundings, and they can respond in simplistic ways to changes 
but we don't call that consciousness. Somewhere on that spectrum, there's, there's a level that we say, okay, this is consciousness. How do we do that? Yeah, you're absolutely right that a, that a frog is aware of the fly because it yeah. reaches out and grabs it and eats it, right? So it's got, it, you know, there's lots of animals that have awareness. Generally, tree, consciousness is the awareness of being aware. And, the, and a tree is aware of autumn because it sheds its leaves. So well, that's a good point. Yes, that's true. That's sensing and responding. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. So, but, but the awareness of being aware, the frog doesn't know that it's aware. How do well, we know that? <laughs> um, uh, so there's a clever experiment that you can do with wasps and a wasp, uh, will, um, it'll clean out its nest. It makes a little, some of these are, they, they make one little nest and they lay one little egg down there. It goes and clean, it puts the food down that's going to put in there. It cleans out the nest and it comes back to, to grab the food and put it in there. If you move the food, it will then It'll, it'll then put the food where it should be, go back in and clean out the nest again. And it'll, it'll clean out the nest, you know, a hundred times in a row. It has no awareness that it's doing it over and over and over again. It's doing wow. it simply by programming. Interesting. Yeah. Well, if, if um, uh, this is unforgivable, maybe I'm still jet lagged. Professor Mark Solomons, that's right. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if you're familiar with his uh, work, Chet. Um, he's a, Neuro, neuro, neuropsychologist, neuropsychologist um, oh. Professor Mark Collins, and um, he actually proposes that any that, that consciousness arises from the deep structures of the brain, and oh. that consciousness consciousness is um, he's written at least six books. He's the the most uh, uh, the latest one is is um, the, the Hidden Spring. Uh, you might find it interesting to read Mark Solomons. Um, he he's a fellow South African, yep. and and he propo he proposes that that consciousness arises from um, homeostasis. So he actually oh, it does. Um, yeah. uh, he, he 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 proposes that um, unlike people thought before, consciousness does not arise in the frontal lobes, but it derives from the deep structures of the brain yeah. and and therefore um animals like crocodiles and frogs are indeed conscious uh, yes so, that is true that is the conclusion you would make from that and yeah i've seen the same thing that 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 the 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 base of the brain the hypothalamus and that area is is uh the seat of consciousness and they've shown that you can remove the uh the cere cerebral cortex and still retain some sort of consciousness. So, yeah, I, that's a, that's a good, yes, that's a good answer. So I guess I don't really know because it's quite possible that lizards are conscious at some level. Yeah, well, yeah. well, you uh, and uh, trees don't have sub levels of the brain and superior levels of the brain. So what's going on there? So I think that to have consciousness, you need four elements. You need to be able to sense things. You need to be able to perceive them. You need to be able to remember them. And you need to be able to act on the world. And I'm saying if you don't have those four things, you can't have what's called consciousness. So I want to bring in here, because you, you talked about being aware of being aware. And it made me think of the mirror test, which, of course, some animals pass and some don't. You, yes. This is where you, you put a blob of paint on their forehead and show them a mirror and they either think it's somebody else or they recognize and try and re remove the blob. And th there's an interesting little video I've got um, stored in my Twitter account where a bear is going through the forest and somebody has put up this large, shiny metal mirror. And the bear sees the mirror and is startled, he thinks it's another bear, obviously. And he goes and looks behind it and finds no other bear and he comes back and it's still there again and then he knocks it down and stamps on it so he's one of the creatures that has no self-awareness correct um just quickly I'm, I'm writing this down it's memory um the ability to act um senses senses perception Sensing. which is the way of decoding your senses into to meaningful objects mm. memory and then some ability to act on the on the world. So, so I want to. Um, it's 
I once read a book, Supernature. It's an old book. And I, if I'm thinking of a, a, there's a particular acacia tree that grows in the far north of uh, South Africa. And uh, some years ago, uh, there was this quite a severe drought. And the kudu, I don't know if you, it's, it's a, a very large antelope. And uh, they are, uh, they, they are, Tree, they eat the branches and the leaves of, of this particular type of acacia tree. And um, the trees were still growing. So the, the trees had were green and they had leaves and there was enough water, but it was quite dry. So the, the, the environment was under stress. And then the kudus, which are very hardy animals, started to die. Uh, and upon investigation, they found that um, the, the trees were under stress. And because the trees were under stress, they released more tannins into the leaves and therefore they were very untasty to the animals, so much so that they didn't eat and therefore they died. So um, uh, then the only aspect, if, 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 if one reasons like that, then the, the only aspect of consciousness that trees do not have is memory as far as <laughs> because it, they sense that there's stress they yeah. act on the environment they have yeah. perception and then they act on the environment by releasing more tannins so yeah. it's it's very interesting I, I i wouldn't say that trees are conscious like we are conscious obviously but i'm i, I don't know if I'm, I'm not trying to play devil's advocate but i'm just thinking about um mm. this idea of of consciousness so are, are, uh, are you are you willing to accept that a thermostat is conscious um well it's not <laughs> i would have to well no because because it doesn't have memory as well, well it could have memory i suppose yeah. <laughs> if you, huh? oh yes the, my husband's just reminding me that the, the trees in the same area also sort of sent a, yeah. the trees could sense the stress in the other trees that were being eaten yes. from yes yes so, so it's like a, a warning a warning um, yeah. recently we We've discovered they're in a root community, haven't we? But but that just goes to show how difficult this is. Yeah. Um, and yeah. and I think one should perhaps lay a consciousness uh, uh, as as we lay a, and, and accept that there are different levels of consciousness, perhaps. Yeah, sure. uh, I think so. It, um, it's it's a it's a wedge, isn't it? A, a, I'm reluctant to use the word spectrum because I think there's an increase in capability here. So I'm using the word wedge or ramp. And we we need more words. You know, we've got one for the top end and, and we've got awareness for somewhere down near the, the thin end of the wedge. But we need more. It's a stepwise thing. We need more graduations. Yeah, I think so, and it's really hard to say where where consciousness stops in in you know in the levels of different kinds of animals. But uh, the key here, though, is that through sensing and perception. So perception, we understand how perception works. You have a perceptron; it's a neural net. The neural net can decode raw input and can come out and recognize tables and chairs and martini glasses, right? Yeah. Um, Memory then works by making physical connections. You have these nerves that basically represent things in the world. And by making a physical connection with them, you make these associations. And those associations are fixed in memory. They're, they're, they're stuck in your brain. And when they become activated, that's when you think about it. So if somebody says groceries, it'll bring in, it'll activate a bunch of things that you associate with groceries. And maybe it'll associate with taking a trip down and buying some groceries. And then do I have money? Uh, does my credit card have enough money on it? I mean, there's, you go from thing to thing to thing. These are all structures that are in the brain and they have intentionality. That is the structure in the brain represents something in the real world. And it's that mapping between the brain and the real world, which allows you to then uh, talk about the world and to communicate about the world. And then we associate words with it and those words have sounds and I make those sounds and those sounds come into your ear and your perceptual system decodes it into those words and ultimately you you get the meaning not exactly the meaning but close enough if we're able to communicate you'll get something close enough and it works and and we can have a conversation mm. 
And then the, one of your later questions is, how did consciousness come about? So uh, I'll have a stab at that. I think that um, it's come about gradually by evolution. And at the moment, I don't know of any in non-traversable discontinuity between uh, simple elements of the universe and the most sophisticated ones. I, I don't know of any barrier. There's no um, Moses cleft the Red Sea event in, in this continuum, mm. to my mind. So I'm thinking that um, you, you can even go right back to the inanimate and, and track the progress from hydrogen to Einstein, if you see what I mean. Yeah, but something very significant happened about 40,000 years ago. And this was the ability to us. I mean, if you look at a dog, a dog understands the environment, but it's all very immediate and it's very, you know, in fact, the dog kind of has to keep looking at something to keep it in mind. Yes. Humans gained the ability to talk about abstract concepts. Yes. Okay. And that brings us around to universals, by the way. So now, oh. now, now we're here on nominalism. We may actually be able to get done with this before the end of the hour. But yeah, um, yeah it's exactly that. The, the ability to, to, we can talk about talking about things. We can, you know, there's this self-referential capability, which human consciousness has that no other kinds of our consciousness seems to have. And that is that we can, we can pose hypotheticals. We can then do forward projections on what's going to happen. We can think through various options and then we can make decisions on based on how we want the outcome to, to come. And this is, this is the difference that then allowed humans to basically dominate the world and wipe out half of the species. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. we, we can, I would like to make the distinction that we can do this at very large scale um, because I have to tell you that I had a dog who understand abstract concepts. That little dog would jump on the couch next to me and I would say, you are stinking. I'm going to give you a bath. <laughs> and I would say, you stink. And he'd look at me and I said, I'm going to bath you. And he would look at me and jump off and run away. But, yeah. but so, so I'm convinced there's yeah. enough evidence that animals can, like dogs, for example, can remember, can, can be conscious. But I think humans, uh, have achieved this at a level of complexity that we are, as far as I can see, the only species that has achieved that at that particular uh, level. And and the fact that we cooperate um, at a at a very eff effective and efficient um, uh, level. Yeah, and and dogs can they can plan they can plan ahead they can think oh I'm going to go here there and there I mean they can do that kind of linear sequencing. But what, what you can't convince a dog of is, um, well, if you give me that now, I'll promise you a nice place in heaven in the <laughs> afterlife. I mean, there, yeah. there is no convincing any other animal on the planet about an afterlife. The humans are unique in that aspect. Absolutely, absolutely. And and the our retention of those abstract ideas, I think are way much longer. And something else that comes into it, this might, might come in later, um, humans also have the ability to work together very constructively in larger groups than other social animals. Yes, but it's it's also more than language. Um, I'm not familiar. I can't remember, but there's a research, a research, a research prim, primate researcher. It's not Franz de Vol, who showed that. Even primates that can work together in in groups very effectively, the moment um, the group size goes above about 120, mm. about the maximum number of individuals, okay. then things begin to fall apart and it splits. But humans can yeah. work very effectively together in groups of larger than three, four, five, six hundred thousands of people. No oh. other species can can achieve yeah. that. And, and I think maybe it's also because we have this, the, the abstract thinking and the retention of abstract ideas, um, which includes remembering a goal. We want to work towards a long-term goal 
Um, whereas with even other primates who we know are very conscious, mm -hmm. the, the, like, like you say, it's the promise of heaven. Uh, <laughs> it's afterlife. You know? So let's hear your definition of universals again. So a universal is a unit, a unit of shared meaning. Okay, so it's something that we can point to and and uh, discuss and just subscribe. So, you know, the numbers one, two, and three, those are those are units of meaning, which we give names to. But here's the interesting thing. Uh, remember, I said that intentionality is aboutness. It's, it's that a concept can be about the thing that it's about. But in the case of universals, the thing that it's about doesn't exist. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's defined. So a triangle is defined. Uh, so when you say the word triangle, it's about a triangle, but there mm. is no actual triangle. There's no perfect triangle out there. No. I mean, Aristotle uh, struggled with this. Plato struggled with it. And it, it really comes back to William of Ockham, where he said, hey, there, there's nothing there. It's no, no. nothing. It's just a name. It's an idea that we impose on the universe ourselves. And yeah. we associate that idea with the definition. So we can... So we can explain what the definition is. I can tell you what the definition is, and we can start using the word triangle. Mm. But there, but there really is no triangle, and and, and it, there's no three either. There's no three. There's no numbers. Um, yeah. and and that is nominalism. It's yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the other school of thought is uh, Platonism, isn't it? That um, that, that these things do actually have an existence and. Uh, and, and we've discovered them rather than invented them. I'm very much not of that school of thought, but it's been ongoing in the in the field of philosophy for centuries, the argument about that. It, it is. And, you know, Plato didn't understand information theory. I mean, none of these guys did. And we're at such an advantage because all information theory has basically come about in the last hundred years. Yes. So now we know how we can make data, we can make programs that manipulate information, all that kind of stuff. So we really, I mean... Plato felt that to understand what a cow is, there had to be some perfect cow that your mind reaches out to and touches. Yes, yes, That's yes. how you get the meaning cow in your head because yes. you had to touch it. Yes. Uh, now we know that you could you could just have a data structure which represents something that doesn't exist. Yes. Yes. Of course, this was back in the day when they thought that sight was achieved by arrows actually coming out of your eyes. <laughs> yeah, it actually came from your eyes. Yes, That's yes. Right, yeah. yeah. And then you saw the shadows on the cave wall, but anyway. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so well, that's it. I mean, I, and and to 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 all of the audience, uh, you know, I'm I'm I love to debate this stuff and discuss it. So you probably find some problems with my ideas, and I'd love to hear about it. And and oh. uh, please give me feedback, and uh, let's see if we can figure this stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I've had so much fun. <laughs> Well, me too. Yeah. I, I want to flag up who we've got as our guest next week. And it's another interesting guy. His name is Howarth Lewis. And he, he's, I think he's got his own website or channel called Perspective Philosophy. So it'd be interesting to hear his views on things. And then the week following, penciled in at the moment, is Alan Cartwright. Pastor Alan Cartwright, who was our guest three weeks ago, I think. And we were very kind to him, but he wants a more conflicting interaction with us. He wants to come and prove to us that uh, the Bible is true. And uh, so he's going to send me a point. <laughs> finally, finally, someone will do that. That'll be great. <laughs> and then looking further ahead, we've got another interesting guy. Alistair Crawfish, who I bumped into today, he's he's in the researching lithium-ion batteries game. So he's at the cutting edge. So there you go. Guys, thank you very much. I think it's been fascinating. And I just got to call things to an end because we're in a countdown. Ten seconds. I do want to thank you both, and I want to thank all my friends who, who helped me work through this. I'm very much indebted to a lot of people on this, so appreciate the opportunity. We are, great. we are greater than the sum of the parts. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Two brains, one. Absolutely. Yeah. So, 
thank you very much, viewers, in the future and in the no, we can't say in the past, can we? <laughs> okay, here we go then. Say bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you.